I want to thank you all for joining me and our fantastic speaker. Today I have Professor Mike Snyder with me. Mike Snyder is the Stanford Asherman Professor and Chair of Genetics and the Director of the Center for Genomics and Personalized Medicine at Stanford University School of Medicine. He's a leader in the field of functional genomics and proteomics and one of the major participants of the ENCODE project. His laboratory study was the first to perform a large-scale functional genomics project in any organism and has launched many technologies in genomics and proteomics that have been used for characterizing genomes, proteomes, and regulatory networks. Dr. Snyder received his PhD training at the California Institute of Technology and carried out postdoctoral training at Stanford University. Thank you all for being here, and I'll now pass it over to Professor Snyder. Great, well, thanks very much, Jackie. It's terrific to be here, and I look forward to sharing with you what we're up to and uh, what's going on in the field of virus detection and vaccine development. And I think all of you know, this is an incredibly hot area right now, uh, one very pertinent to the current pandemic. So what I wanna do for this talk is go over what's going on in COVID-19 SARS-2 uh, background there, give you a little background information. Then I'll talk about what's happening now in terms of infection detection and new technologies that are coming out in this area. And then finally, I'd like to tell you about vaccine development and what's emerging in that area. So um, by way of background, just I'm sure all of you know, probably a lot of what I'll tell you already, but COVID-19 is a disease and it's caused by the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus. Coronaviruses are common colds, but the SARS-CoV-2 obviously is fairly special. Um, it first appeared in Wuhan, China. Uh, it definitely has originated in bats. And what's not so clear is whether it went through an intermediate species before it transferred over to humans, or it went over to humans and evolved a bit before becoming its current form. It's very different. Oh, sorry. It's obviously a huge problem these days. Uh, even though we're f finally going on the downswing a little bit, there's still over 140,000 new cases every day. So that we're still in the midst of an incredibly uh, important pandemic. And I think most people will agree this virus is here to stay. And so how we're going to deal with it, how we're going to detect it, how we're going to you know, defend ourselves against it is a hugely important topic. So what's special about uh, SARS-CoV-2 and, and COVID-19 is that it's very different from most uh, viruses. Most common colds, they actually infect the upper respiratory system, but occasionally a very severe strain comes along like SARS, you may recall, tw two decades ago, or bird flu. They penetrate deep into the lungs and that's why they cause severe problems and kill people. SARS-CoV-2 can do both. It can be sometimes hang out in the upper respiratory pathway, but also can penetrate deep into lungs in many cases. And so that's what makes it uh, particularly problematic. It's also problematic in the sense that it can spread asymptomatically. And, and there's a number of studies out there that are a bit all over the place. But I think the consensus is emerging that somewhere on the order of about 40 to 45 percent of, of infections are asymptomatic, meaning the individuals never get symptoms. And so they can potentially be spreading this virus without even knowing it. And of course, that's a huge problem since that then can let this thing become incredibly widespread. What, why is uh, SARS-CoV-2 so special? Well, it has two kinds of changes that are very different from uh, the regular common cold coronavirus. And they both occur in this protein called the spike protein. So this is a protein that sits on the surface of the virus. And as I say, it has two very significant changes that are out there. One change actually affects what's called the receptor binding site. So there's a change in there that makes it much more high affinity. So it'll bind what's called the ACE2 receptor on our cells and therefore um, help it penetrate. And the other thing is there's a cleavage site in the spike protein that's important for propagation of the virus, if you will. And basically what's happened is there's been some genetic changes in this region. Both these are found in the bat, actually, uh, or, or evolved from the bat. And so what's happened is the, these cleavage sites uh, allow much, much more efficient cleavage, these changes that have appeared. But they actually use the human enzymes to cleave them. And so now what happens is this virus can spread very, very efficiently in humans, very differently from the original common cold coronavirus that's out there. 
Uh, what's also concerning these days is that there's at least three major variants out there that are attracting people's attention. One is this UK strain you may have heard of. <clears throat> its features are it's very fast spreading, thought to be at least 40% more transmissible. It doesn't seem to be a, a problem from the vaccine standpoint. That is, when you get vaccinated, you still make antibodies that neutralize it. Uh, but there is some very, very recent evidence that says it might be 30% uh, more lethal. There's also a South African strain that's uh, now come into the U.S. It has a six-fold reduction. This is why it's concerning. Six-fold reduction in protection from <clears throat> neutralizing antibodies. Uh, and so people are worried it's partially resistant to vaccine. And then the third strain that's also emerged is this Brazil strain, if you will. It also seems to spread very rapidly. Uh, and it may have also reduced response to neutralizing antibodies. So the concern is that some of these strains may actually get around some of our vaccinations and make them less effective. But um, they are uh, certainly emerging. They're, they're, there's no question that some of these strains like the UK and Brazil one will take over. They're just moving very, very quickly. Some people estimate as quickly as six weeks, they'll become the dominant strain in the US. And they're already uh, in many, many different states, if not all. So how do we detect these viruses? Well, there's several major approaches that are out there. The gold standard is this one, uh, the PCR test. And there's another one. These two tests, PCR and uh, antigen tests, detect active infections. So the PCR test involves, I won't get through the details. You can learn about more of this if you take our certificate program. But you, you actually, what you'll do is you'll, you'll have a probe to the nucleic acid part of the virus. It's called the, the RNA part. And you can amplify that. You actually take a nasal swab and then you collect a little bit actually on a simple Q-tip, if you will. And then you have, um, you can amplify the virus and you can have very specific sequences so you can detect it. It's very, very uh, sensitive assay. The antigen test doesn't really go after the, MR, the, the RNA part of the virus. It, it really detects the protein part, the part that's typically on the surface. And so what you'll do there is you'll, same thing, you'll have a nasal swab. And you can do something called an ELISA assay. It's a very simple, very common assay that a lot of diagnostic companies use. We have antibodies that will recognize the protein, and you can also tell this is occurring. Now, both these assays, they actually don't turn positive. If you get infected, you won't be positive until about three days later, three to four days later according to most estimates. And so there is a lag phase. But nonetheless, this one, when if you do catch it at that time, it's quite sensitive. It works in the vast majority of cases. It's false positive rates fairly low, typically 1% to 3%. For the antigen test, uh, um, it's not quite as sensitive. Uh, and it's false positive rates probably similar, maybe a little bit higher. But um, both these are, are the tests that are commonly used. I'll come back to why their advantage and disadvantage in a minute. There's another kind of test that's out there. It's an antibody test. And so if you've ever been infected by a virus, what will happen is you will make antibodies to it. They protect you, and they hang around for a long time in your blood. So what you can do there is simply draw blood from a person and run a test if you have, uh, you can see if you have antibodies against the virus by having some of the common proteins, again, set up in a nice little assay. And you can, again, detect whether you've had antibodies. So the advantage of this is you can tell if you've ever been infected by a virus, certainly within the last six months or a year, you can tell from the antibody test, but it won't tell you if you have an active infection. In contrast, these, these do. So, now, uh, the pros and cons then, again, the PCR test is very sensitive. It's the one most people use when you go get tested. Uh, the problem is it takes 24 to 48 hours to get back your result. The antigen test is, is probably less sensitive. It is less sensitive, but you get your result back in 15 minutes. Very convenient, and it's actually a, a bit cheaper. And finally, the antibody test is a very different kind of test. It tells you whether you've ever been infected in the past. It won't tell you if you're infected now. What's kind of nice is that these are becoming more convenient. So these days you can usually get a PCR test by being able to pick up the kit ahead of time. There's a number of kits that are out there. You actually can do the nasal swab at home and you simply drop them in a mailbox or a drop off site and then they'll mail you back your results in 24 to 48 hours. 
There's also, these are very newly emerging, some at-home tests that are coming. These are not so expensive. The range varies a bit. Um, yeah, they're ranging, people estimate, around $30, so it can be more. Uh, again, they can be done in 15 minutes. This particular one is approved for four, uh, two year olds and higher. I think this one might be 14 years old and higher. So the point is that you can actually do these as simple home tests, kind of like a pregnancy test. You can see right on the spot if you've got a positive result. They're, they're not as accurate, just to warn you. Uh, as what you'll do for a gold standard test, but nonetheless, they're very convenient and it's better to get tested uh, than not at all. And so it's thought that the sensitivity of these is on the order of about 40% or so, uh, but you can do them many times. Uh, here is also, there's recently emerged a very new PCR at home test. This one takes 30 minutes and it's not too bad overall. Okay, so, so that's what's going on right now for testing, again, becoming more and more common. But there's a new kind of technology that's emerging out there that we think is gonna be powerful. And this is an area that we work on that we're trying to revolutionize. And this is using wearable sensors. So you may know that smartwatches and other sensors are, are worn by millions of people. In fact, 21%, 50 million people in the US alone wear a smartwatch. What's powerful about them is they'll make hundreds of thousands of measurements on you every day. They follow you 24 seven. So they're always following your physiology. And in fact, they can measure many, many different kinds of things. They can measure your heart rate, something called heart rate variability, respiration, even blood oxygen can be measured. Skin temperature can be reasonably accurate and blood pressure and so on. So it depends on the devices, different devices measure different things and they measure them with different accuracies or resolution but they uh, are quite powerful. And so uh, the way we got into this business by all, uh, somewhat interestingly is because I actually discovered my Lyme disease using a smartwatch and something called a, a pulse ox. Um, and so I won't get into the story in too much detail, but the bottom line was uh, um, I had been, I discovered my, my heart rate was abnormally low for my smartwatch and my blood oxygen was low for my pulse ox. And later I learned my skin temperature was off as well. And so uh, it turns out that, and it was due to Lyme disease that told me it's, I was being infected by Lyme before I had symptoms even. And so I talked to a doctor, he actually told me, recommended penicillin. I said, no, I need doxycycline. It's a little bit tense, he gave in. And sure enough, I got tested, I was lying positive. It's a very well controlled experiment. But anyway, that prompted us, I'd been wearing a watch for two years. We went back and looked at every single time uh, I had a high heart rate, and you can't see that, but that's on the X axis, or high skin temperature. And it turns out there were four times when I had high heart rate and skin temperature. And every single one of those, I had high, uh, what's called a high biomarker for being ill. So one was the Lyme time I told you about, that's these triangle days. Another was a viral disease listed up here on the star and that one that's called high CRP2, we now know is a viral infection. And what's very interesting and very important was there was a time when I was asymptomatic, this one here called high CRP1 with a circle. Uh, I also, so I was clearly ill because I had uh, this high biomarker, but I actually was, did not have symptoms. And every single time my smartwatch told me I had high heart rate or high skin temperature or a combination of both. So that prompted us to write an algorithm called change of heart that lets you tell you when you're getting ill by this change in heart rate, change from your baseline. You can see it jump up and it turns out it operates in advance of symptoms. So you can't tell well here, but uh, off to the right, um, the top four slides are me. That's what's called a delta plot. You can see change from base basic heart rate, it jumps up every single time <clears throat> that I was ill and it jumped up in advance of symptoms and not only worked on me, this algorithm worked on three other people, one of whom got sick twice. So we had been actually improving this algorithm and building a, a big infrastructure you'll see in a minute to be able to do this at scale when along came the pandemic. And as you might imagine, then we ramped this up incredibly rapidly. So we have an IRB approved study, love to have you join. We'll send you the link uh, in just a moment. And what we did was we partnered with leading companies like Fitbit and Garmin. We very quickly enrolled 6,000 or so people who signed up for our study. 
And we, we started by training our algorithms on COVID positive people who were wearing a Fitbit, where we had wearable data at the time of infection. And we had 32 of those. We call these gold data sets. And so these were, uh, we just took these and wanted to see, can we see this jump up in heart rate? And it turns out the ans answer is yes. This is actually, in fact, our very first person who rolled in our study. This is the days here um, in one axis. If you look at that purple day, day 48, that's when they were diagnosed with COVID. The red day, day 47, is when their symptoms first appeared. But if you look at the resting heart rate in this top plot, you can see this jump up nine and a half days before they had symptoms, their heart rate jumped up. And so this person was presumably ill nine and a half days before symptoms and was running around spreading it and had no idea. And we've written an alarming algorithm I'll tell you about in a minute. That's the bottom plot that can see can detect us in, in potentially real time. And so, as I say, we had 32 data sets that worked in 81% of the cases, 26 of them all showed a positive signal at or before the time of infection. And it turns out there's a median of four days prior to people having symptoms that we can tell uh, this elevation in heart rate. And in fact, for, again, for a number of people, it was even 10 days before a symptom. So we, this works as an early early detection system. Uh, it also turns out it's seven days before diagnosis on average. That's the middle plot. And then on the right, it's not specific for COVID. If you're ill from other things, it, you also see this jump up in resting heart rate. And that's a median of two days. And this makes sense because for COVID, people tend to have a longer asymptomatic period than for other illnesses. So that's why COVID has four days we detected early versus two days for other illnesses. So uh, we've now, as I say, written a, uh, an online detection system, and this is retrospective data, meaning people we already have data from, but you can see the very top plot, same thing, this person, we've set the alarming in a way that it goes off roughly every two months when people uh, are doing their normal thing, but when a COVID infection comes along, it can jump up like the case on the top line. This one's, I think, about seven days early, in the middle line, the one all the way to the right here is actually um, the COVID illness, but there are other bumps and, and we know other things can trigger the alarm. Actually four out of seven people get a holiday bump. I don't know if that's stress from in-laws or alcohol or travel. There are, other, there are things that can trigger the alarm that aren't COVID infections. Uh, and as I mentioned, if you look at panel C, that this is a person who had another illness, they triggered the alarm as well. And even healthy people will have alarms. We don't know if those are asymptomatic infections or stress periods or what have you. We're actually collecting more data on that to better analyze this. But nonetheless, it does work and it's pretty sensitive. In this initial study, it was 67% of the time we could pick up these infections at or before symptoms. So we've now uh, set up a, a collection system, a whole infrastructure for being able to pull in people's data at scale. We want to do this for tens of millions of people, pull in their data, and then we can display back their wearable and other data actually on a very nice dashboard and at very different time resolutions. You can look at whatever scale you like. And we've now rolled out the second phase of the study where we're alarming people in real time. We have 3,000 people signed up, you'll see in a minute. And it does work. This is actually, a, I think, our first case. This is a case where it's set up at a daily resolution. But this person had a, an alert go off basically a day before they had the symptoms shown here. And that was the day that before they were diagnosed and tested positive. So again, we can pick up these alarms early. And so far, we, as I say, we have 2,700 people enrolled. 63 of them have turned positive while wearing the device. We only just started the study at the beginning of December. And uh, 44 of them, or 70%, received a positive alert prior to symptom formation. So we think this could be a very, very powerful approach. And again, it's scalable to millions of people right now. And smartwatches themselves aren't that expensive. Even a cheap one for 100 bucks can do what I'm showing you. And so we, again, think these sensors could be super powerful. Uh, since we first published our study, along with a group from Scripps, um, shown at the bottom, also with a Fitbit, other studies come out. Uh, so this works uh, for a group, showed this for Aura Ring, another group has just put a paper online, not yet reviewed, for Apple Watch, and we have it working for Apple Watch as well. In fact, our latest study, uh, that the one we're running now, will let you detect this with uh, Fitbit, Apple Watch, Garmin, uh, basically any device you should sign up. 
Okay. So the other area, obviously, that's hugely important for managing this pa pandemic is vaccination. So I'll tell you a little bit about what's going on there. So you probably know there's a lot of different vaccination strategies out there. Uh, there are at least four major types. So there's one with mRNA adenovirus. Those are the ones I'll talk about in a minute. So this is a common cold virus too, called adenovirus, different kind of cold. Uh, virus. And then there are other strategies as well that are mostly being used in other countries, not so much in the U.S., with the exception of the Sinovavax one that's in trials right now. That's using a portion of the spike protein as an imogen. So I'm going to start by telling you about the mRNA vaccine, what that's all about. So this st study really starts about 30 years ago. It turns out that you know, 30 years ago, um, somebody had the crazy idea, two groups did, of just sticking DNA right into somebody's muscle, injecting it straight in. And it turns out that makes antibodies. That was um, quite impressive at the time. And so, um, and that comes out of basic research that people were, were doing. <clears throat> then, I think it was 2005 or so, the structure of the coronavirus protein got solved. And then another key breakthrough is actually being able to make a stable form of the protein. If you're going to vaccinate it, you actually need a stable form of the protein so your antibodies can recognize it, neutralize it. And that was set up by another uh, group as well. So there's been a series of important scientific um, advances that have let this vaccination, this mRNA vaccination work. And so the way it works now is that uh, you can take the spike gene, if you will, uh, it actually, you, you make a modified mRNA version. So mRNAs are actually the information transfer from genes, and they actually will code for proteins. So what you can do is, and, and this is what both Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines are doing, they make mRNA copies, if you will, from the gene, and then those get encapsulated into a lipid, little lipid particles. And those get basically get injected right into your muscle. In fact, just on Sunday, I had mine injected into my well, my right arm. And what will happen then is those those mRNAs will start producing spike protein, and you'll make antibodies to those, and those will be protective. And that's the general scheme for how this works. Now, one thing I want to let people know, some people sometimes ask, oh, am I modifying my DNA? The answer is no. This is mRNA. This is not your going into your DNA at all. This is... Uh, you know, sitting in your cells, it's producing protein. So don't worry, you're not genetically modifying yourself if you get this vaccine. Okay. Um, and so it actually seems to be incredibly protective. You've seen the reports. It's at least 95% protective. You get two shots and it works really, really well, probably better than I think anybody anticipated. And it's also pretty remarkable if you think about it, because this whole thing was all pulled off in less than a year, which is Probably it certainly is a world's record from start to uh, an approved vaccine. The other vaccine that's out there comes from, it's called the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. So there, there were some researchers in Oxford who were trying to make a vaccine to also another nasty coronavirus called MERS that wasn't quite as rapidly spreading, uh, but it's pretty serious. It does kill people. And so um, what they were doing is they took an adenovirus from a chimpanzee. So it's a, again, adenoviruses are common colds. You do get them. Uh, they used a form from a chimpanzee, thought it would be a bit, little bit uh, less problematic for humans. So that was the one they were using and is a replicating uh, virus that they use. And what they do, it's the same kind of idea. You take the spike gene, if you will, you insert it into the viral DNA in that case, and then you use the virus to actually stick into people's arms and infect people. Uh, and, and again, this virus then will be making the coronavirus protein, and then you'll go ahead and start making antibodies against that protein, and that gives you protective effects. And this vaccine also seems to work pretty well, um, and certainly from two doses, people seem to be in good shape. And then there's another one that's about to emerge. Uh, they're waiting for approval. I think it's expected any moment from Johnson & Johnson. What's special about this, this is also an adenovirus uh, kind of um, uh, uh, vaccine where, again, you use the spike protein. They all use the spike protein, the surface protein uh, that they basically produce. And then, again, peop um, you make antibodies. That. What's special about the Johnson & Johnson, it was set up to just be a single-dose vaccine. 
Uh, so far, it seems to be about 70% effective, maybe not as good as the others. So here are the pros and cons. The mRNA vaccines are special because they're not immunogenic. They're just sticking this RNA inside you, directly into your muscle with uh, you to do, use lipids. One minus is oh, mRNA is not so stable, so you have to store it cold. One of them, you actually keep it a, a very deep freezer called a minus 80. The other one, you can store in a regular freezer. You can pull them out and re have them refrigerated for a little bit uh, before you use them, but you can't, they're not stable forever in the fridge. Uh, and you basically need two doses of these. The AstraZeneca Oxford one, uh, it's very uh, effective, similar to this one, very stable. Um, people do worry. Some people do have strong reactions to viruses, and so that may not be so good for them. Uh, it does require two doses. And the Johnson & Johnson, as far as I can tell, the main advantage, it's a single dose. It's not clear that it's as, it's as effective yet as AstraZeneca or the mRNA ones. Uh, that's a mistake there. Sorry about that. Okay, so in summary, what I've told you about is that our information about viruses has just absolutely skyrocketed thanks to the pandemic we're in. And uh, now people, to be honest, take viral infections a lot more seriously than they used to. I think uh, don't this virus is here to stay, so we are going to have to keep our guard up as to how to come up with newer and newer technologies for detecting it and protecting ourselves from it. And we also have to worry about future pandemics as well from other viruses. Uh, but there are um, incredible people out there working on new methods for detecting and, and these uh, viral infections at a very early time. So you can actually, you know, potentially self-isolate and not infect others. And our ability to make vaccines, and I didn't talk about it, but some of the therapeutics that are out there has just been absolutely incredible. And so these are going to be important tools for being able to better keep ourselves healthy and, and manage uh, uh, infections when they do occur. I do want to acknowledge the members of my team. I have an amazing group of people all working on the wearables project, uh, and I won't have time to go through them all, but thanks to their very hard work, we've actually been able to get this our study out there. And I would like, uh, again, all of you to sign up. It'd be fantastic if you would do so. We'd be able to collect more data. And um, it we hope that this will be an important strategy for being able to defend ourselves against not only this coronaviruses, but infections in the future. So thanks again for having me here. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your presentation with us. So thank you for sharing your questions with us. Um, I'll begin with the first question. The first question is, are the rapid tests as effective as the tests that take 72 hours to receive results? Yeah, the PCR, hopefully you can hear me fine. The PCR tests are actually more accurate than the antigen tests. And most of the rapid tests are the antigen tests. So they're not quite as accurate, but, um, but they are very convenient and they're also cheaper. So you can run them more often. So some people think that maybe the way to go is to get everybody tested every few days with these these um, rapid tests, even if they're not as accurate because you'll get tested more frequently than those where you simply use this PCR test, which are more expensive, uh, probably a little less convenient. So that's a trade-off and people are working, obviously on making them more and more accurate, but it, it, it has to do with the technology as to why they are the way they are. Great question though. Our next question is, can the mRNA get into the nucleus with reverse transcriptase? Um, I'm not aware of any evidence of that. It seems like that would be a pretty low probability. We're not putting reverse transcriptase in these vaccines, so um, it would not be likely. So you don't, I don't think that you're gonna wind up modifying your, your DNA with these mRNA vaccines. Okay. And the next question would be, how would you comment on the differences in terms of efficacy between other vaccines, for instance, the flu and COVID? Yeah, the COVID ones seem to be so far much, much more effective. And that's because the uh, flu virus really mutates itself much, much more rapidly than, even, than coronavirus, which does mutate some. 
Uh, and so the, it's generally thought that the few in any given season, the flu vaccines are probably anywhere from 30 to 70 percent effective. And I think everyone was a stand that these mRNA and so far it looks like the AstraZeneca ones are really quite effective. The mRNA ones, the data are pretty good. They seem to be greater than 95 percent effective. And that's really amazing. Uh, much, much better than any flu vaccines. And is the mRNA vaccine better than the inactive vaccine for COVID-19? Uh, I think the head-to-head -head studies will still have to come out. They weren't done exactly the same way, which makes it a little bit tricky. I think AstraZeneca is hoping it's as effective as the mRNA ones. Uh, it has to do with they ran theirs at a lower dose than a higher dose. And so in head-to-head -head comparisons, it may not be good, but it may not be quite as good, but they didn't do it exactly in head-to-head. -head. That's the problem. I didn't say that right. So it's not as clear. And so far, the, the um, Johnson & Johnson one, from the data that I've seen, seems to be less effective. But it is single dose, so that's the trade-off. It's a great question, though. Okay, for our next question, for COVID-19 vaccines, can they still protect people if the virus mutates a lot? And how can we say a vaccine is efficient? Like the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine was 95% effective and others were 75%, 50% effective. Is it measured by how many people have antibodies after the injection? <laughs> Yeah, it's more measured by how effective they are at neutralizing and, and in, in the long term, it's actually ability to block spreading. Um, so they certainly don't block the infection per se, but they do seem to, to at least protect people. And one um, report I've seen recently is that so far from the first 75,000 people that have been vaccinated that actually got COVID, uh, there's evidence that they were exposed to COVID-19 uh, not a single person has been killed. So they do seem to really be helping people um, in this case. Now, some fraction of them obviously do not get totally protected. 95% is not the same as 100. So it is escaping in some cases. Back to your original question, how do we protect ourselves if the virus is mutating? That is a serious concern all of us worry about, that the strains that will emerge will be the ones that you know, aren't protected against, and those will be the ones that will start spreading again. One of the nice things about these technologies is it's fairly easy to swap out uh, a new strain that emerges from an existing strain. The problem is you have to run these long trials to show safety and such, and that can slow things down. But nonetheless, it's still very powerful to be able to quickly swap out a new variant mRNA, for example, than the old one. So. We'll try, it's a bit of a, um, you know, cat and mouse game that the virus is trying to get, you know, further out there and spread and we are trying to protect ourselves. And so there, there will be a battle going on for a while. So, but the hope is at least the, the advantage, by the way, of having a larger part of the spike protein used is that you don't just make antibodies against one part, you usually make it against several parts. So even if one part mutates, you'll get some protection is the hope from antibodies against other parts. And so uh, the hope is that at least it'll help. And that may be the difference between, you know, you surviving one of these infections and not surviving if you have some protective antibodies. And the next question is, I read that the SARS-CoV-2 can be detected in feces. Is detection from household wastewater for SARS-CoV-2 and other viruses feasible, or is it in the works? Yeah, it's a great question. And the answer is a number of groups are looking at that. You can do it. In fact, people are talking about going into sewage plants as a way to detect what variants are out there and how frequent they are and where they are. So it may turn out to be a great way to measure the population spread of this virus. So it turns out that's true of a lot of colds. They wind up in the feces. Okay, we have a, we have a lot of vaccine questions. Um, the next one is if the J&J &J vaccines were to have a booster shot, a second shot, would the results be even more effective than the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines? Yeah, it hasn't been done. It, well, the trial wasn't set up that way, to my knowledge, at least not in the first part. 
So we don't know the answer to that. I, I think most scientists would expect that to be the case, that a booster shot would be helpful, but that has not been done. Great question. Okay, and then this one um, refers to your wearable study. Uh, what's the false positive rate, the alarm but no COVID? Yeah, it depends how you set the alarm. We set it so it goes off every two months. So there's a little bit of a trick here. You can actually maximize the sensitivity so the alarm goes off every day and then it'll go off very early in an infection. Uh, or you can dumb it way down, but then you, you, you take the risk that you're waiting longer before the alarm goes off. So we decided that roughly once every two months is the right sensitivity. So we think so far, like I say, in 70% of the cases, we can see uh, we can detect infections of people who've had COVID. So uh, that is a trade-off. And and uh, but I don't think it's very hard to contextualize what's going on. So, for example, we do know alcohol will trigger the alarm, and not if you just have a few drinks for dinner, that won't do it. But if you really tie one on and you're hungover for the next day, you actually might trigger the alarm. Or if you run a marathon. Uh, your heart rate stays high for a few days, and that might also trigger the alarm. So you do have to contextualize it. If you've been doing something unusual, uh, I'd say don't worry about it. But if you're just sitting around, you know, listening to a webinar like this one, and suddenly your heart rate's running high for, you know, 12 hours and your alarm goes off, um, something's up. You're either very stressed, you're ill, something's not right. So, uh, so that part you'll have to contextualize. And I'll also point out, by the way, that we don't know the difference. What We're not sure yet. We would just know, for example, an alarm goes off. If you are infected, it could be due to COVID. It could be due to other viruses as well. We're not there. So we are trying to bring in other kinds of information. Right now, we built the whole thing around resting heart rate because that's what we can get the data for. Uh, and STEPS is incorporated in there as well, a little bit of sleep. But we know there's other things that will help us a lot, like skin temperature, respiration rate. So as we bring in more of these these other kinds of physiological measurements, which you can get from a smartwatch. We hope to get more specific. Uh, and also maybe we'll be able to tell the difference between a COVID versus another infection. I'm pretty sure we can tell the difference between a bacterial infection versus a viral infection. We know that from actually the Lyme case, the time I got Lyme disease. And regarding wearables, wearable technology seems to give us an amazing amount of data. However, what behavior changes would you suggest people who test positive adopt outside of isolating from others, wearing masks, et cetera? In other words, how do you see us using the information that our wearable technologies capture? Yeah, just the way you described, obviously we're, we're not approved for this yet, but what you you know, would think you would do ultimately is that if you got a positive signal, you would self-isolate. Uh, when we have at-home tests, you might do a follow-up test and just see if you are positive or, you know, go to a physician if you start feeling wor worse. So those are the possibilities. It's not unlike your car, if you think about it. We have dashboards on our car. They're incredibly valuable. They tell us when we're running low on gas, the engine light goes off. You don't just keep driving around when your engine light's going off, or maybe some people do it, but then their car gets trashed. So I think what you want to do is when these alarms go off, you, you use that information to better guide what to do next. And that's how we see wearable devices. They're really the, they, along with your, your smartphone, are really the dashboards, if you will, for your health. And by the way, I'm a true believer in this. I'm wearing, I don't know if you can see, but I'm wearing four smartwatches right now. So uh, we're always testing the different devices. I often wear a ring, but I lost it. So, so anyway, I do think these will be very, very powerful health monitors of the future. Just like you wouldn't drive your car without a dashboard, uh, I don't see why people you know, run around uh, and ignore their health without, without a sensor that could help them. Um, do you have a published uh, data set and is it available online? It is, so feel free to go to our paper. Uh, we're actually probably the only group that's sharing data out there. There are now several studies that are either submitted, a few of them are published, 
and it's just impossible to get the data. It's a real uh, pet peeve of mine that people don't share their data well. So anyway, we do have our data online. Go to our paper, or if you have any issues, email me, and I'll put you in touch with the right person, and you can get access to that data. We do anonymize it, uh, meaning we'll shift the days and things like that. So, um, But otherwise, it's available for you to use. I'm sure some of you can build better algorithms than us. Uh, we do have pretty sophisticated people on the project, though. Um, and is there any evidence on the duration of immunity provided by any of the vaccines that you've talked about today? Great question. And the answer is that's being closely monitored. So I don't think people know how you know protected they will be a year after they're vaccinated, six months and so on. So that's being followed pretty close. We do know the antibodies persist for a while. And is it enough to give protection uh, against the next viral infection? It may depend on the dose, meaning a super high dose may overcome any low level antibodies you have running around, but low level doses may be perfectly managed. So, so this is the sort of thing people are following very carefully. And so, I, you know, I wish I had a more definitive answer for you, but it, it's the, the, way it, the way it is. I think the encouraging part is again, that people who have been vaccinated so far, no one has died to my knowledge. And so that really is a, an encouraging sign that they are being protective at some level, but we'll have to see how long that lasts. Great, and maybe we'll need booster shots uh, every, you know, nine months or every two years. It's not clear yet. Okay, and why um, is there a need for two doses in the mRNA vaccines? Yeah, now the mRNA vaccines don't have what's called an adjuvant that kind of promotes your immune response, they clearly work. A lot of people do get sore arms, I sure did, when I got my vaccine. So they, they do have some effect, but they don't, they're not um, set up with, a, a, with this adjuvant, which gives a really strong first response. And so it's thought that the two doses will actually give a better protective. The first dose triggers the, the, the immune response and the next one really gives you a much stronger boost, if you will. And, and so that's one of the arguments used. Great question. And then why are spike genes the target of all of the vaccines? Yeah, because they're on the surface. They're the things that uh, the spike protein recognizes the receptor on our cells. This receptor happens to be called ACE2. And if you can block that interaction or block, yeah, just get in the way of it, then the virus can't really enter the cell. So. So that's very, very important for the immunity to be, to be able to hit the outside of the virus so it really can't get in. Once it gets in, it's off and running. And then what would you say to people who tell you, I will not get vaccinated because nobody knows enough about the vaccine or they make claims that people uh, may become infertile, et cetera. How would you convince them? Well, I'd say look at the data so far. Certainly the short-term effects look pretty fine. Millions of people have been vaccinated. Uh, the number of deaths, one could argue about, most people would say it's zero. Some people say, well, maybe there's a few. We're talking many millions of people have now been vaccinated. And look how many people have died when they've gotten the coronavirus. So that number is very large. It's probably on the order of at least 1%. Uh, depends what the, as the asymptomatic number is. But uh, uh, weighing the odds, I'd say you're much, much better getting vaccinated than getting a coronavirus infection. Mm -hmm. And do you believe the um, COVID vaccine uh, that you'll require a new vaccine every year, like a flu shot, for instance? I think we're gonna have to see, yeah, whether, uh, you know, if new emerging strains come, it will make sense to morph the vaccine strategies that we're using. I think the st overall strategy will be the same, but the actual sequences that people use will probably get altered as well. Um, and so it's possible, it's possible. Okay, and do you see a development of uh, mRNA vaccine for uh, a flu the flu, for instance? It's possible, yeah. I, I think that's, in fact, quite likely. I think this is going to be a general strategy, and, and certainly these companies are all working on this. So it, it could become a whole new strategy. And again, most people like the A concept because it's a little bit cleaner than putting a virus into people, even if it's a virus that causes common cold. 
a lot of people like you, it's probably better not to have a virus at all. So there's a good chance that this will become the future of vaccination. And so the mechanism of vaccines encourages the immune system to act against the virus. If this is true, what is the risk that the immune system will be exacerbated in such a way that it will also react fighting the body's own cells? Yeah, I think people do worry about this. To what extent do viruses in general or vaccines trigger autoimmune disease? Certainly, you know, historically, obviously, the, the things they put in kids, those are, those are very, very low. Uh, is it zero? I, d I don't think we know the answer yet, but I don't think there's any reason to think that the vaccine will be worse for causing an autoimmune disease than the viral infection itself. So I think these are things people worry about. It's, it's very clear that COVID-19 does have these long hauling effects, so to speak. Uh, that is to say that there are effects that seem to last for months and it's not clear what they're due to. So I think people are very, very concerned and trying to follow what's going on there. Doesn't mean they're autoimmune, by the way. There could be other effects that are caused as well. But these are the things people do worry about. Again, I don't think there's any reason to think that the, the vaccination would be worse than the viral infection. Uh, again, speaking for myself, um, I personally think it's a lot better to get a vaccine uh, and then a viral infection. And in fact, that's why I got the vaccine. I think pretty much everybody will tell you the same thing. Uh, and especially if you're at risk for certain things, I think uh, you're really putting yourself on the line if you don't get vaccinated. And in light of potential restrictions to only give one dose to many versus two doses to a few, what are the pros and cons about mixing vaccines, for instance, Moderna for the first dose and AstraZeneca for the second dose? That's a great question. And nobody's done that because uh, it's not set up that way. The trials aren't. But I think that could be a very powerful strategy if you think about it. Uh, but we'll have to see. And I don't know how long it'll take to run trials like that. But um, I personally like that concept. Uh, and but we'll have to see. Um, we, we just don't know. It's as you can tell, it's still very early days. The first vaccines just got approved in December. So these are all great questions that we just don't know the answer to. Right. And um, the next question is, is my PhD uh, being used to track recovery from COVID-19 or other viral illnesses? And are there any or have there been any interesting outcomes? Yeah, we, we're doing that now. We'd love you to sign up and, and collect, we want to collect your data. It's very, very clear. We can see heart rate patterns persist well after the infection. So we think there are lingering effects from people who have COVID, not in all, but in a subset of people. And so we are trying to follow exactly what you just said. So we would like to collect that information. We, we have some other studies going on where we're actually doing what we call microsampling, sampling small droplets of blood from people so we can see what these long-term effects are. And so we do want to collect that information and better understand what is going on. And maybe that'll help us suggest treatments. Uh, also maybe predict early on who's going to have a long-term effect by their initial signals they get. So you can imagine a case with a smartwatch where certain signals go off of a certain type. Maybe someone uh, has a very strange heart rate variability, for example, or other things, and that predicts severity or long-term effects of a COVID infection. And, and that could ultimately be powerful for treating such people uh, and, and certainly identifying them. So great questions, though. So it looks like we have time for a couple more questions. Um, the next question is um, that you mentioned uh, mRNA vaccines, um, that they do not modify genes as mRNA only produces more proteins. Uh, the question is, is there any evidence or a biomolecular knowledge that could confirm that there is no indirect way that it could affect DNA either short or long term? Uh, I'm not aware of any, so um, yeah. I think it's very unlikely um, that it itself will affect DNA. Now, you may be raising an issue, a general issue, which is I not so clear. We have evidence, for example, you may not know, I'm type 2 diabetic. 
And it actually came about because of a viral infection. In fact, it's the first time someone associated a viral infection with type 2 diabetes. I got it right after a nasty, in that case, respiratory syncytial virus. That's why I followed this field fairly closely, in fact. And it turns out that actually it didn't, uh, you know, it didn't modify my DNA, I don't think. But there's something called epigenetics where your DNA can get chemically modified. And it actually turns out that um, my DNA did. In fact, my immune cells were just, you know, shifted a little bit in, in their chemical modification, the epigenetic change. And we think that's what triggered my type 2 diabetes. Uh, it's, it's very correlated with that. It's hard to prove, but it's very correlated. So it is possible, going back to your point, that there is uh, uh, um, uh, some long-term effects that are due to indirect uh, aspects of the viral infection. It's probably not the mRNA itself, though, inserting into your DNA, which I know is what a lot of people are concerned about. That seems, you know, that's not your biggest concern. Okay, and what if um, we don't get the second vaccine in three or four weeks or even eight weeks? How effective will the second dose then be? I don't think we know the answer to that. I would recommend you get your second dose. <laughs> um, and for the wearable study, how do you account for exercise? Uh, yeah, we. I, I didn't emphasize this, but it's resting heart rate. So we take the periods while you're not re exercising. In fact, we put, we found the optimal window is, is 10 minutes after moving is when we take this information. So you not only have to stop moving, but we won't take your, your heart rate for the next 10 minutes. So that turns out to be a reasonably accurate measurement of resting heart rate. And so then you can really see these shifts up. And one thing I want to emphasize is we all have very different resting, excuse me, resting heart rates. And so um, this is why this works. We can measure your resting heart rate really quite accurately, 24-7. And when you do see a viral infection or other kinds of stress, you will see that shift. It's only seven beats a minute. It's not a huge number, but that's very, very easy to, to measure when you're taking hundreds of thousands of measurements on, on a person a day. You even small amounts, when you measure them over time, you can pick it up with very high confidence. Okay, great, and last question. Um, if you have autoimmune conditions and are on immunosuppressants, will the COVID vaccine be effective for you? You should see your doctor. Um, I have my own thoughts here, but it depends on the nature of your illness. And I, I, so I think you should talk to your physician about this and they will also devise a strategy with you, which vaccine, I would hope they would, which vaccine is best. I have my own thoughts, but I'm not a physician. So you're better off talking to your own physician. All right, thank you very much. We're getting close to the end of our webinar, so we'll need to wrap up now. Um, thank you, Dr. Snyder. If you'd like to learn more from Dr. Snyder and the rest of the genetics faculty, we encourage you to join our Stanford Genetics and Genomics Certificate Program. Um, you'll have more than 90 hours of content to learn from them, as well as access to videos and exercises to sharpen your skills. A link to this recording uh, will be emailed to you soon, so feel free to revisit this content. Once again, thank you for joining us today. We hope you have a great week and we hope to see you again in future sessions.